Hello everyone, Spirit of Thersites here. Last time I covered the DNC and I promised that I would come around to cover the RNC. At the time when I made that promise, I did not realize how many speakers there were at the RNC and how much time each of them was allotted to speak. I wasn't too surprised that they went with a different formula than the Democrats for their convention, but I was surprised by the sheer volume of speakers. I will provide a couple of general comments and then get into the people I've chosen to highlight. For this video, what I decided to do was limit my scope to 14 members of the RNC who are close to Trump. So this is basically the inside circle, the family group of the presidential ticket. We have the Pences, all the various Trump children and spouses, and then Pompeo, Carson, and Haley who are some big-time Trump supporters who have been with them from the outset. If I had this to make over again, I would include Kellyanne Conway, but that seems like a lot of work, and I think I'll just save her for the next video, assuming that I make one. If you want to see another video on the RNC, be sure to drop a like and a comment to that effect. So, my general thoughts on the RNC. Um, both conventions this year were pretty much dog shit. COVID really wreaked havoc with the ab ability of people to make a convention which looks good. The Republicans really critiqued the Democrats for basically having a Zoom conference. And it's a valid critique. It looked like shit. But I don't know if the Republicans were able to do any better. They had this really weird setup on most days where you had an empty auditorium with speakers coming out of the back and addressing an empty room, usually in a loud and very excited manner. So that in its own way was a mimicry without adaptation of what normally happens. So that in itself was fairly cringeworthy and not altogether impressive. The Republicans also made a fairly smart move by inviting a lot of normal supporters to the convention to speak. The Democrats very much limited their speakers to party grandees who were kept on a very tight leash. So the Republican Party looked a lot more open and had a more big tent feel just because of that. I haven't watched very many of these speeches from the average people who showed up. I imagine most of them are probably not of very high quality. However, the sheer fact that they did speak is probably more important than actual quality of what they said. So um, that is definitely a bragging point for Trump, especially in an election where you have a Biden ticket that includes Harris and when you have a very, very weak economic message on the Democratic side. So... Without any further ado, let's get into the 14 speakers I've chosen to talk about for today's video. First up, we have the man at the bottom of the ticket and reigning vice president, Mike Pence. So, um, it's important that Pence do well at the RNC because not only is he the VP candidate and you expect your VP to come off well, but also just like Biden, um, Trump is someone who you have to worry about, and any VP of someone like a Trump has to be ready to take over at any time. While we normally speak of Biden's declining mental state, and there's a lot to be said there, a lot of people do underplay the fact that Trump is an obese 74-year-old who likes Big Macs. So it is not inconceivable that he might keel over, and then there is a President Mike Pence. So in his own way, Pence had about an equal amount of pressure as that facing Kamala Harris, or at least a similar challenge, maybe less pressure. Uh, overall, I can see two categories for Pence. One is throwback, because in terms of his delivery and taking the usual talking points of Trump and making them sound mainstream and normal, Pence actually sounded like a Republican of 10 to 15 years ago. He sounded like someone who could have run in, say, the 2008 primary, or somebody who could even have run in the 1990s. Um, now, of course, he repeated all the Trump talking points, talked about Biden being a Trojan horse of the radical left, how we need to stop the spread of communism, and all the usual crazy shit that the Trump campaign had to say. 
But to his credit, Pence said it in a way which sounded normal and like it came from a human who was functional. Also, I had to change the categories from my last video on the DNC. I decided to replace boring with unhinged and then take the old boring category and kind of incorporate it into bad. I figured that this would be a more accurate representation of what the RNC was this year. So overall, I think Pence had a pretty good speech. So I'm going to go with good for him. The reasons why I'm putting Pence in good are that he seemed like an adult, he seemed reasonable, and he did a much better job of trying to outline Trump's accomplishments than Trump himself, in point of fact. And if you're, say, an independent who is somewhat in the middle about whether to go for Biden or Trump, you might be encouraged by Pence's performance, because you know that there's a, you know, a chance, at least, that Pence has some sway within the administration, and also a chance that uh, Pence might take over as president within the next four years. So even if you're not a big fan of Trump, maybe Pence came off as the adult in the room and the safest bet out of the four people on the ticket. So um, pretty big win for Pence, and I think that this was the kind of counterbalancing act that the Trump convention needed. Because most of the people speaking were firebrands, Pence was much more subdued, and usually that would come off as boring, but when everybody else is so over the top, you can actually make yourself stand out by being a little on the boring side. So I think Pence actually, because of the context of this convention, was very much on point. Next up, we have Mike Pence's wife, second lady, Karen Pence. This is the first time I've ever seen her speak. So I'm not super familiar with Karen Pence. But um, she is basically, at least she comes off as a normie Republican. Now her reputation is as someone who is a very, very zealous Christian. And apparently Mike Pence refers to her as mother and I think she calls him father. So it's very 19th century and it comes across as weird. And we've heard all of the stories about how Pence won't dine in the presence of another woman unless his wife is present, etc., etc. However, for all of the weirdness that uh, surrounds them, Karen and Mike did not really display that at the convention. And Karen Pence had a fairly easy role to fill, to be fair. She just needed to seem dignified and like a decent person. She didn't really have to go out there and do anything controversial, and she didn't. What separated her from the good category, however, is that we normally look for a sort of sense of warmth and um, the ability to comfort and make people feel welcome from a first or second lady. And Karen Pence is fairly cold. She's kind of icy. So she seems like a normal person. She seems like someone who would do her job and um, host at the White House if that became necessary in the event of Trump dying. But at the same time, she does not seem like someone who would be particularly good at the role of First Lady. Um, she did speak about being a part of a military family, and um, that in itself is good because the Republicans always try to appeal to veterans and active duty military. They've been losing ground in that regard over the last decade or so, um, but having the Pence's around probably helps some since they are not nearly so privileged or separated from the mainstream of American society in the way that the Trump family is. So overall for Karen Pence, I'm going to go with mixed. It was decent, but it was by no means great. And by the way, when I'm talking about whether these are good or bad, I mean, are they good or bad to what I perceive to be Republicans on the one hand and independents on the other, right-leaning independents who are willing to consider Trump, or even some people who are disaffected Democrats. For the most part, winning over people who are partisans of the other side is basically a fool's errand, but you can win people around the margins. So... That should be noted. Another thing to note is that there are plenty of speakers who we're going to talk about 
who made some fairly dubious claims. The Pences weren't really among them, but there were plenty who made some pretty dubious claims. I'm not going to be fact-checking them. PolitiFact exists for a reason. You can go there. Snopes, whatever else. Um, just I'm just looking at how the rhetoric would have played on someone watching this who is not the kind of person to go and research all the facts. So, probably should have clarified that earlier, but as you can see from my clock, it's pretty late. I'm not at 100%. I'm just trying to get through this bullshit so I can go to bed. Okay. Next up, Eric Trump. So, one category that I could see for Eric is actually throwback. Um, much of what he said revolved around his father being a businessman, the greatness of business in the private sector, and the flag and Trump's accomplishments. And if you just look at his mannerisms, um, it just came across as the stereotypical Bush era business first Republican. And actually, Eric's mannerisms are not that similar to his father's. I'd always assumed that both he and Don Jr were more or less carbon copies of their dad, but Eric is actually a fair amount different, um, which I found pretty surprising. Really, with Eric's speech, another thing I expected was him to make some of the more wild claims that members of the Trump family are known for, but there was really nothing crazy and also nothing memorable about his performance. It was fairly bland. Um... Now, granted, at many, uh, say, a convention 10 years ago, this would have been seen as fairly out there, but by the standards of 2020, this speech was kind of boring. But not necessarily in a terrible way. And given that the expectations for Eric Trump are so low and that he has been mocked as a moron on countless occasions, I think he didn't do that bad. I'd have to put him in the mixed category. I'm not really sure if he would appeal to all that many voters. Not many people judge presidents on their children. But um, certainly he doesn't deter anybody from voting for Trump, I don't think. Um, so given his reputation for being a little inept, that is perhaps as much as one could ask for. Next up is Laura Trump, the wife of... Eric Trump. Laura has more political experience than her husband, and she helped Trump run his campaign back in 2016 despite having no previous political experience. One thing she had going for is that she is a native of North Carolina, which is actually a swing state, unlike New York, so Trump thought that he, that she could help him translate with the people there. And um, yeah, so she does have some experience, but she's by no means a professional. And um, I'm glad that I looked that up after the speech because otherwise I would have really savaged her as someone who was fundamentally incompetent at their job. Um, really, she was on message, but uh, really boring and said nothing at all interesting. Her delivery was pretty flat. Um she talked about women and how Trump is pro-women and how his organization promotes a lot of women. Um, she talked about being a member of the family, the Trump family being down to earth and opening, open and welcoming. And uh, Yeah, there wasn't really much there. I don't necessarily think that her speech would turn anybody off, but at the same time, it was pretty bad. So I'm going to go with bad with the caveat that this would not be bad enough to deter voting for the Republican Party. But still, if you were watching this live, it very much might dampen your enthusiasm or cause you to turn the channel because it was a rather underwhelming performance. Next up, we have Trump's eldest child and namesake, Donald Trump Jr. Donald Trump Jr. is much more like his father than Eric is. In fact, you can see it when Trump Jr. speaks. He does a similar hand gesture to what Trump does. He kind of uh, does an OK sign and moves it up and down. Now, Trump has more interesting hand gestures than his son, but clearly Trump Jr. is trying his best to imitate them. He also kind of tries to imitate his dad's voice, which is weird, because when he first started speaking, he was using his natural voice, then he switched into kind of his impression of his dad, 
And actually, his natural voice is way better than his dad's voice. Actually, Trump Jr. has a great voice for speaking. And if he would just go with his natural voice, he would be massively more effective rather than trying to do this odd impersonation of his father. But, you know, he made a bad decision, as is his want. So, uh... He did all the talking points of the Trump campaign, the idea that Biden is a radical leftist, that um, the Democrats are coming after everything that you hold sacred. At one point he said, this election is about church, work, and school on the other hand, on the one hand versus riots, looting, and anarchism on the other. Um, wow, that's uh, quite a dichotomy and uh, citation needed to say the least. Donald Jr. also said the GOP is the home of free speech because of cancel culture. Uh, again, we would actually need to see some evidence of the Republicans doing more than complaining about the Democrats when it comes to issues of free speech. I have seen very little evidence that the Republicans are champions of free speech. As a party, they have rarely, if ever, done anything on behalf of free speech. I just made a video earlier tonight talking about how, in part, um, the Bush administration tried to silence or at least prevent footage of dead soldiers from being released to the public. And before that, his father, Bush 41, and Reagan both tried to push the idea that debating about the merits of foreign wars was unpatriotic. So the Republicans do not have a leg to stand on on this issue. So, on the one hand, this kind of red meat definitely appeals to the Trump hardcores. However, this kind of shit probably doesn't play that well with normie Republicans, and certainly not with independents. Therefore, Donald Jr.'s speech is unhinged. And in terms of pure rhetoric, I would say that he was the most unhinged of anyone I covered. Of course, it is his girlfriend... Kimberly Guilfoyle, who got all the credit for being unhinged, but I would say somewhat unfairly. Her rhetoric was actually, if anything, a little more moored in reality than her boyfriend's, but not by much. Um, Guilfoyle has become a meme since her speech. She's been compared with Rita Repulsa. I had to use a picture of Rita because I was a huge Power Rangers fan growing up, and I'm just really happy that people remember Rita Repulsa. She was a great villain, one of the best of the early 90s. As for Kimberly Guilfoyle's speech, she called Biden and Harris socialist. This is a talking point of the Trump campaign. And she said it with conviction, which really makes me wonder about her mental health. Oh, by the way, interesting uh, observation about the Trump sons as opposed to their father. Donald Sr. is obsessed with being with women who are much younger than he is. But both of his sons are with women who are older. So Laura is only a year older than Eric, so that doesn't really count. But uh, Don Jr. and Kim are actually nine years apart. She's 51, he's 42. I just find that interesting. Um, anyway, that's neither here nor there, but it's just something that occurred to me. So, Kimberly Guilfoyle's speech. Um, the one thing that drew a lot of people's attention is that she claimed to be a first-generation American right before she talked about her mother being from Puerto Rico. And everyone, of course, who knows basic geography knows that Puerto Rico is a part of the United States. The people who live there and are born there are citizens just as much as if you were born in Iowa or Alaska. And here is the kind of election year thinking that people pass off in the comment sections of YouTube. There were debates in the comment sections of the Guilfoyle video where Democrats were pointing this out and Republicans were countering with, well, what she meant is that it's not a state, so it's not really the same as being American. That's just stupidity beyond imagining to debate over that. Um... Yeah, Puerto Rico is a part of America, guys. The end. That's the whole conversation. That's all there is to say on that. And she used her Puerto Rican identity, which again is an American identity, just Hispanic, but still American, 
to speak about her personal knowledge of socialism in Latin America in Cuba and Venezuela. Cuba and Venezuela, of course, are different countries. Puerto Rico, as part of the United States, has never experienced communism. So, yeah, kind of weird. She also said, look at California as an example of how the Democrats govern. Then she talked about the really cool things about California and said it's now full of drugs and crime. There are drugs and crime in every state in the country and every environment, whether urban or rural. The Republicans did a lot of time, a lot, spent a lot of time bashing Democratic cities, but what they ignore is that there are plenty of drugs and there's plenty of crime outside of the cities as well. Actually, the crime rate is fairly even if you look at it per capita. So it was this deranged, lunatic assessment of the state of the world. Um, let's see, is there anything else interesting about Kimberly Guilfoyle? Oh, yeah, um, ironically, after complaining about the so-called riots, Kimberly said that we Republicans light things up. Of course, she meant that the power grid is stable, but... Uh, yeah, one could counter that Arnold Schwarzenegger was a Republican governor in the recent past, so he has a role to play in California's power grid. And also, um, if you're talking about phrasing, if you're an anti-rioting party, you don't want to say, quote, we light it up. Because that sounds like you're saying that we shit set shit on fire, which is the exact opposite of the message you're trying to convey. So, um, yeah, pretty unhinged and uh, generally a terrible speech. But I actually think that her boyfriend was crazier, just by a hair. Next up, Melania Trump, the First Lady. She had a long speech, and her task was a relatively simple one. Just like with Karen Pence, her goal is to be dignified and respectable, avoid too much controversy, and come across as warm and empathetic. She did not come across as super warm, but she wasn't cold, and she did seem to have some concern for people suffering in America. So she did okay. It wasn't anything special, but it was serviceable. A little boring in places, and um, yeah, the thing I found far more interesting than anything that she said, because the only thing remotely controversial she talked about was how Trump supports school choice. Everything else was like really basic, boring stuff. So, of course, Melania is not a very fluent English speaker. And in the comments, there were Democrats attacking her for her accent and poor use of English, and then Republicans defending her by saying she's a brilliant woman who can speak five languages, despite the fact that all the footage of her speaking the other languages she supposedly knows shows that she barely knows them at all and that she's way worse in all three of her extra languages than she is in English. And then they talk about how she must be have an IQ of 140. And like, I saw some crazy comments trying to make her sound like a, a genius. And also some comments really just trashing her for not being better at English. And it really doesn't matter. Uh, people can understand what she says. That being said, she's clearly not a genius, but she doesn't have to be. The First Lady has nothing to do with how the country is governed. So, who gives a shit? As long as she can show up to events, smile on occasion, and do the bare minimum, that's good enough. So, as far as I'm concerned, mixed performance uh, won't change anybody's mind, but also completely irrelevant. So, no harm, no foul. Also, no gains. Next up is Nosferatu himself, Count Rudy Giuliani. So, just like all New York politicians in 2020, Rudy Giuliani has to let you know at every breath, every labored breath in his case, that he is in fact a New Yorker and a damn proud one. Uh, I noticed that he wasn't looking good or sounding good. He was he had heavy breathing. His color didn't look quite right. He looked like he was using a lot of makeup to try to look a little ruddier. Uh, really not looking great up there, and I don't think he'll be in the Trump administration all that much longer. 
Hopefully, uh, he's fine, but who's to say? Anyway, um, just a lot of fear-mongering about the left, the kind of standard stuff that they're running on this year. He talked about lawlessness, and he says that, in his own words, paraphrase, the left wants to destroy the country, and he said that literally and without any sense of any any sense of uh, moderation. I mean, who the fuck goes up and says that the other side literally wants to destroy the country? Um, even a lot of the Democrats who were fear mongering about Trump didn't go quite that far. They did say that it's a battle for the soul, which kind of means the same thing but at least doesn't make it out to be as melodramatic. I mean, this is just pure melodrama and fear-mongering in its purest form. This is McCarthyism. This is fucking nuts. He said that the riots are brutal, and they're all in democratic cities. He said that there's been a slaughter of young victims. This is unhinged madness. He was able to name a few names of people who died... But for the most part, um, just unhinged madness and a complete failure to recognize that most of the people in the streets were peaceful protesters and they had a reason to be there. I can't remember who it was, but there was one of the Trump sons, I think it was actually Don Jr., who acknowledged that very basic point before going off to soliloquize about riots. Uh, With Rudy Giuliani's view of the world... It was just an angry mob of zombies who flooded the streets and started fucking shit up. Just unhinged madness. Next up is Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State. I didn't realize it, but apparently he is fairly popular with the Trump base. Surprised they really followed him that closely. Pompeo's a pretty boring guy in almost every conceivable aspect. His speech was not well conceived. He was broadcasting live from Jerusalem and his sound was really scratchy and you could hear the wind blowing and it was just kind of like a 2006 YouTube video where somebody turned on the webcam on their laptop and just started rambling and you could barely hear what they were saying over the roar of their laptop. That was basically Mike Pompeo's speech from an audio technical perspective. And given how much shit the Republicans gave the Democrats about their technical presentation, that's not good. If we talk, think about the substance, he talked about being in Jerusalem, his family. He talked about Trump's foreign policy, safety. I think that the people who already like Trump and like Pompeo were pleased. But in terms of really reaching out or expanding what he was, uh, the base that Trump might potentially have... I don't think that Pompeo's speech really accomplished anything. Um, If anything, the presentation was too boring to pay attention to. The substance was okay-ish. And if the sound had been better, I might, I think I'd probably go mixed, although on the lower end. But because of the sound issues in the video, I have to go with bad. Next up is um, full-time neurosurgeon, and part-time archaeologist Ben Carson. That's a joke about some shit he said in 2016. He claimed the pyramids were built as grain silos, which, if you don't know why that doesn't make sense, just think about the size of a pyramid versus the amount of space available inside and the amount of resources required to build a pyramid as opposed to, say, your standard grain silo. Anyhow... Carson uh, did give Trump some defense on the issue of race. He said that Trump has been good for black people. And coming from a black guy, that is not a bad thing. The Republicans are very much into a tokenistic approach to saying we're not racist. You have somebody of the affected group come out and say, he or she is my white friend. They are not racist. Peace out. And uh, Ben Carson did that which, you know, works with a lot of Republican voters and I think actually works with a lot of independents. The whole friend of a different race thing often gets mocked, but I think it actually does have some validity. Um, so I, I understand why the Republicans keep going back to that well. 
It's very predictable, though, so I, I get annoyed at seeing the same tricks, you know, speech after speech after speech, year after year after year. But, of course, if something works, you're not going to stop doing it. The thing about Carson, though, is that outside of vouching for Trump's not being a racist, he really didn't do anything. Um, he was He's an awful speaker. He always seems like he is highly dosed on antidepressants or maybe he's had about half a bottle of liquor and he's the kind of guy who gets really sleepy when he drinks or something like that. I don't know, but just really not a good performance. Um, he didn't say anything interesting or substantive and what he did say was really boring. The way he said it was boring. Um... The only interesting thing he's ever said, other than the pyramid comment, is in 2016 he randomly started rambling about how he once stabbed somebody. Um, unless Carson is off talking about crazy shit, this is someone who has no charisma and is incredibly boring. So I gotta put him in bad. I don't think anybody could have watched that and then been impressed and really fired up to vote for Trump unless they were already there to begin with. Next up is Nikki Haley. She has been one of Trump's favorite Republicans since 2016. She is the former governor of South Carolina and Trump's ambassador to the UN. It's well known that Nikki Haley has presidential aspirations, so part of Trump's reason for siding with her so much is to keep her close, so that way she won't use the opportunity to try to rise up and rally the rest of the party against him. Probably a wise precaution. That being said, I think he might, if anything, overestimate Haley's political skills. But that's neither here nor there. We're here to talk about her speech. So, she began her speech oddly and in a self-serving way. Suffice to say, if I had retained the category of self-serving from the Democratic video, she would be candidate number one, Exhibit A. But as it is, she began by speaking about a random female ambassador from 1984 who spoke at the convention on Reagan's behalf, and effectively she was trying to get you to think of her, an upstanding public servant who serves a president who's controversial, but just does her solid best and uh, you know works to make the country a better place. What she was doing was striking a balance between talking about herself and the party, and praising Trump, but not going too far. If you're a never-Trump Republican, and you watch the speech, you will be convinced that Nikki Haley is not a, Repub a um, Trump loyalist. If you're worried about her being disloyal to Trump, she'll, she says just enough to keep you satisfied. So Haley is playing politics here, and she's actually doing it pretty well. That being said, not only the invocation of Reagan but also just some of the lines that she delivered. I have to go with throwback. I'll elaborate a bit more. She had a pretty clever inversion of BLM. So normally a lot of Republicans will say something really cringeworthy about what BLM might stand for. A lot of times it's pretty explicitly racist. But what Haley did was very much in line with the Republicans of the pre-Trump era. She said, yes, black lives matter. There are black cops, black business owners, and black kids who are being killed. Then she talked about the shooting in South Carolina and the black church. So basically she, instead of rejecting the idea or accepting the terms of debate from the other side, she tried to subvert BLM to serve her own purposes and redefine the black community in a way more favorable to the Republicans. So it's kind of a throwback to what Republicans used to try to do, and also a much better than average version of that. So, pretty good there. I think you could also make a case for her speech being in the good category, simply because, just like Mike Pence, she provided some relief from the people who were yelling in the empty auditoriums and talking about socialism, communism, Radical Islam and uh, Trojan horses and all this other crazy fucking shit. 
So uh, definitely added a little bit of normie appeal and the sense that there's an adult in the room somewhere. But ultimately, I think what she was trying to do is self-serving, and it is a kind of throwback. I bet if I had to guess that she's hoping that Trump fails, which will pave the way for her to run in 24, and say, well, you know, I knew that Trump wasn't the best president, but I served him to the best of my ability, tried to moderate him, and I served my time for the party. So I should be rewarded by both wings of the party because I am a loyal member. Anyway, moving on. Let's talk about the daughter that Trump ignores except for election years. Tiffany Trump, the daughter of Marla Maples. Tiffany is uh, not a good public speaker. She just graduated from law school, so I have no idea how she plans to pursue a career in law given her speaking abilities. I assume that she's going to be some kind of a contract lawyer who works behind the scenes and never has to appear in court to testify or cross-examine anybody. Maybe some kind of corporate law where you don't really have to do that much in-court stuff. Uh, I can't imagine her in a criminal case. I can't imagine her in a constitutional case. Wow. So, uh, with Tiffany, she had really bad delivery. She had no passion. She was boring in terms of what she said and how she said it. Um, listening to her, I'm not sure what was going on, and I don't want to be too much of a dick about it, but... I think it's safe to say that she either suffers from some kind of minor speech impediment or else she recently had dental work done because just the way that she was saying things was very odd. It just didn't sound right. It's the kind of off-key speaking that you normally hear with an older politician who's clearly having denture adjustment issues or something of that nature. But Tiffany's only, I think, 26, so I seriously doubt that she has dentures. Um, I don't know what was going on or if this is just how she talks and she just has an impediment of some kind or other. That being said, um, I got to go with bad. Again, nobody cares about the president's kids all that much. But if you were looking for a first family where everybody is well-adjusted, competent, and successful... Tiffany would have been better off just standing up to wave after Trump congratulated her on graduating law school and not saying a word, because her speech was bad. Real bad. Next up is Ivanka Trump. But it's either Mike Pence or Ivanka Trump who had the best performance at the 2020 RNC. I've heard her speak in interviews and in very short speeches, And I think she also introduced Trump back when he announced his candidacy. So I had some expectations about what she'd be like. But I was expecting her to probably end up in the mixed category. As it is, however, I think she actually did really, really well. She made a lot of dubious claims. And I imagine that PolitiFact had the longest article on her when compared with every other Republican. That being said, um, she did a great job of getting through all of the Trump talking points on the radical left and rioting and looting and all that stuff. And she said it with enough passion that she didn't quite sound like your typical Republican. But at the same time, she did seem like a functional adult, more or less. Whereas I can't really say the same for Don Jr. and Kimberly Guilfoyle, for instance, or Rudy Giuliani, the count. Um... So she did a good job with that. She talked a lot about Trump's record. And again, a lot of the claims are pretty damn dubious, but she said them with conviction and she got through a long list of claims. So if you were looking for reasons to vote for Trump, Ivanka was trying to run down the list and she did a pretty good job. Um, Unlike her sister Tiffany, she is very clear and articulate. In many ways, I've noticed that Ivanka Trump speaks much the same way as her father, but with a much better vocabulary and without a lot of the strange emphases here and there and some of the other peculiarities of Trump's speech. In fact, uh, since her job was to introduce Trump, 
And it was supposed to be part of the literal fireworks finale. The idea is you have Ivanka to warm up the crowd, talk about Trump, talk him up, have Trump come out, really get the crowd going, and then have a massive fireworks display. Ivanka had a tough task, and she really delivered. Uh, The crowd was very much into what she was saying. They were lively. They were loud. And by the time she was done, they were foaming for Trump. In fact, um, I hate to say it, but of all the speeches I can remember right offhand, in terms of speeches used to introduce the nominee, I can't think of one better. Uh, Ivanka Ivanka brought her A game, maybe even her S tier game. Uh, this was this was some good stuff. By the time she was finished with her speech, that plan was well on its way to bringing the fireworks finale to a successful conclusion. So Ivanka, good, um, very different kind of good than what Pence brought. Uh, very much rallies the base, reminds them of why they support Trump. Maybe appeals to some independence by bringing some of the Trump energy, but also grounding it in some claims of achievement. So, if any speech from the RNC was likely to motivate people who were on the fence and needed an inspiration to back Trump, Ivanka's speech would have probably been that speech. If someone needed reassurance about the stability of the Trump ticket and the presence of an adult somewhere in the room, then Pence's speech would have been the one that they looked to. And now for the guy between Ivanka and the fireworks finale, the 45th president, Donald Trump. Trump is usually known for high-energy, impromptu performances with a lot of humor, a lot of jokes, and a lot of kind of boyish looks of mischief. So he kind of does this thing where... He says things that he knows are inappropriate and the crowd knows are inappropriate. Then he smiles and laughs and everybody laughs along with him and he kind of makes them have fun. Here he tried something different and it failed pretty badly. He tried his best to say the things he normally says, the -the over-the-top ridiculous things, but in a somewhat serious way. And the problem is that, one, you can't take Trump that seriously. Two, he doesn't know how to do that. And three, when you're saying some of the crazy shit that he's saying, even if you say it in a serious voice, it doesn't really work. Actually, in many ways, the vision that I had during the excruciating hour and ten minutes of his speech, which was simultaneously an example of blatant fear-mongering, but also boring as shit... Um, what I imagined was that he had written the speech or his normal speechwriter had written it. And then Jeb Bush was out there giving the speech, trying to do a Trump impression and deliberately letting his low energy approach dictate how he paced himself. Um, yeah, Trump's whole thing is being high energy, being the high octane guy But in this speech, he was anything but. He looked tired. He sounded tired. Even at the outset of the speech, he was not at his normal pace. And as the speech wore on, he slowed down even more. This was difficult to get through. And I started watching it with my girlfriend because I planned on doing this video. And she was legitimately mad at me that he kept going and going because she wanted to go to bed and he was boring her to tears. Um, so here's the thing, uh, look, I don't know that this would be enough to deter anybody from voting for Trump, because if you're planning on it or thinking about it, then there's a certain amount of crazy that you'd have to accept from the outset. That being said, uh, I doubt that this speech converted anyone who wasn't already on board. He had a great opportunity, his daughter Ivanka did her level best gave the performance of her lifetime, and really had the crowd going. And Trump managed to get a few cheers early on and at the end, but that's only because these are ardent Republicans and because Ivanka had them nice and warmed up. Um, Trump really did not bring the energy, and it was a poor performance. Probably his worst major speech that I've witnessed in terms of 
interacting with the crowd. So this is bad. And by bad, I mean really, really bad. Painfully bad. Probably not all that damaging, but wow. This speech was hard to watch. It was boring. And that's an hour and ten minutes of my life I will never get back. So those are my thoughts on the inner circle of speakers. And again, I unfortunately did forget to include Kellyanne Conway, who is a major part of the Trump inner circle. If you like this video and want to see more, I will do another group of 14 featuring Tim Scott, Steve Scalise, Matt Gates, Jim Jordan, Nicholas Sandman, Marsha Blackburn, Joni Ernst, Daniel Crenshaw, or as he is actually known on his birth certificate, Revolver Ocelot, Kel uh, Kellyanne we talked about, Mitch McConnell, Tom Cotton, and UFC President Dana White. But if you're not interested, let me know, because then I can avoid watching more RNC speeches. That's all I have for you. This has been Spirit of Thersites. Peace out, and if suffering through Trump's hour and ten minute speech doesn't prove that I love you, I don't know what possibly can.